Thanks for joining us on Aiken This Week. I'm Glenn Parker. I'm excited to have Lisa Hall joining us today. Lisa is the museum coordinator at the Thoroughbred Racing Hall of Fame, which is located in Hopeland's Gardens. Both of us have been with the city longer than we want to admit, I think. Forever. Uh, forever. I think, Lisa, you've had a number of different roles. Uh, you actually started out as a day camp counselor. That's correct. At a very young age, at a probably very in young, high school. It was not in college, high close. <laughs> probably in college. But then you've worked uh, with the recreation department. You started out running programs at Odell Weeks, and then part of your responsibility became Hopelands and the concert and Rye Patch. And then eventually a decision was made to move your office to Rye Patch and your responsibility just became Hopelands and Rye Patch. That's correct. Why are you so passionate about Hopelands and Rye Patch? Well, I grew up here in Aiken. Um, and when you grow up in Aiken, you learn to love the history of Aiken. Um, it's a wonderful story. And um, I've always been passionate about history. I love history. I can remember when Hopelands was first given to the city and going out in Hopelands, um, as a young woman and, and taking my nephews out there to play and feed the ducks. And then I also had a, a personal relationship with Joan Tower who um, kind of ran Hopelands and the <laughs> Hall of Fame and the Rye Patch. And I remember the stories and things that she used to tell me. And I saw her passion for it. And so when she passed, I just kind of wanted to take that banner up. And so when I was offered the position, I was very, uh, really challenged by it and really wanted to give it a shot. Okay. Now we're going to talk primarily today about the Hall of Fame. In a, in a few weeks, David Tavener, who's the friends, who's the president of the Friends of the Hopelands and Rye Patch, he's going to come on. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the Friends. He'll also talk to us about the renovations that are going on at the stable. So we won't get into too much of that today. But when did the city take ownership of, of Hopelands? Well, we actually got it in uh, 1970. Uh, Miss Islam passed away, um, of course, at age 102. Wow. And she left it uh, in her will. Um, and so it had to go through a vote for city council for them to accept it. So we did get the property in, in 1970. And I think Rye Patch was similar a little bit later on. I think Rye Patch right. was in 83 or 84? 1981. Okay, 81. 1981. Okay. And similarly, it was left to the city. Correct. Okay. I remember, I wasn't here at the time, but I remember hearing that Hopelands was controversial about why the city accepted it. Why was that? I think the, the people who lived in the neighborhood at the time, they had, uh, had some concerns about, you know, would it increase the traffic in their neighborhood and, and noise level. But the city was able to really work with them uh, and, and get, I guess, all their concerns uh, taken care of. and. Uh, I, I, I'm grateful that they did do that, and I'm grateful the neighbors were willing to kind of sit and listen to the city and, and talk and work together to make it possible. I don't think anybody in Aiken today could imagine Aiken without Hopelands. <laughs> so thank, thank goodness that that, uh, mm -hmm. that happened and was able to be worked out. What was on the property of Hopelands at the time? I know it's pretty close today, but it has changed. It is. We had. Um, the caretaker's cottage was there, the dollhouse was there, the carriage house where the Hall of Fame is was there, and the house was there. Um, unfortunately, the house had to be demolished. It uh, just wasn't in really, really good shape. And unfortunately, back in the, the 80s, I think, uh, it was when he had historic property sometimes, demolishing was the cheaper route to go. Mm. But the city um, had to do what they felt was safe. Sure. And it's, it's neat that the fountains are in the basement of the house, so you can stand up on the steps. And if you look, you can really tell where the wings of the house were and where the main part of the house was. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I bet a lot of people who get married there today don't realize they're getting married on the footprint of what was the home at Absolutely. the time. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's neat. That is neat. The original use of the Hall of Fame, what, what was it before the city started renovating it and making it into a Hall of Fame? Well, the, it was Miss Island's carriage house, and it stored her carriages that she would take out in Hitchcock Woods or out in the horse district. Um, also her horses, her pleasure horses, and there was a hayloft upstairs, and there were bedrooms for her staff upstairs as well. Okay. Tell us, tell us the history of the Hall of Fame. How did it come about? Why <laughs> did the city, what, when was the decision made to establish this Hall of Fame for Aiken? 
Well, I know the Aiken JCs uh, back in 74, 75 was looking for a project and they had decided to, to renovate the carriage house. And I know that money was an issue back then. They didn't really have the money to really do everything they wanted to do. Well then, Joan and Whitney Tower moved to Aiken. And um, Mr. Tower was a former president of the New York Racing Association. He also was the editor for horse racing in Sports Illustrated mm -hmm. magazine mm -hmm. and a noted author. And Miss Tower was um, very much involved in the community, but she also really, really loved horses as well. So when she came into town and they saw that stable and that carriage house, they were thinking, wow, look at all the national champion race horses that have been trained here and there's nothing to recognize them. So Miss Tower put in uh, fundraising mode and got the <laughs> money that was necessary to get everything done. Uh, Whitney did the research on the horses that should be inducted initially and it opened in January 1977. And uh, thank goodness that uh, they did that. It's a wonderful shrine to our, our champion race horses. And Miss Tower put me in my place early on in my <laughs> career in Aiken. I'll never, I'll never forget her. She could, she had a way with people when she wanted something. She did. Yes, she did. Um, one thing I learned about Miss Tower is, if you were respectful and polite, she was wonderful to work with. If she really felt strongly about something and you didn't agree with her, she would try to bring you to her side and, and her passion for it showed. And so a lot of times she didn't have any trouble with getting somebody mm -hmm. over to her side. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that she was that kind of person because we wouldn't have Hopelands and Rye Patch, the development and the, the care of it today if she had not done the work ahead of time. Yeah, she also didn't mind coming before city council and letting them know they needed to take care of Hopelands and Rye Patch back when it wasn't what it is today. Absolutely. Right. She, Some of the logistical stuff, what are the hours, what are the days, those kind of okay. things? Um, we are open September through May, Tuesday through Friday from 2 to 5, Saturday 10 to 5, and Sunday 2 to 5. During the months of June, July, and August, we're open Fridays 2 to 5, Saturdays 10 to 5, and Sundays 2 to 5. Uh, there's no admission fee. We do take donations. Um, mm -hmm. Would love to have people come by and visit and make a donation if they'd like, but if it's, uh, it's still, it's free. And it's a nice little museum to be completely free. Sure. We get a lot of visitors. Sure. I know you've gone to Saratoga and different places mm -hmm. before and, and looked at the other museums, and that's where really yes. you get some of your ideas on how to it better is. our museum. It is. Uh, the people up at the National Racing Hall of Fame have been wonderful. Um, the people at the Kentucky Derby Museum, the Keeneland Library in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, the Kentucky Horse Park, which is mm -hmm. in between Lexington and Louisville. Mm -hmm. You know, if, I, if I'm stuck on something or if I'm not sure how to word something or how a poster should look, I call them up and they, they're wonderful to, to work with. And um, they've let me borrow uh, racing footage and photographs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I saw a poster that I thought would work really well at our museum, they would send me the text so I wouldn't have to retype everything. Okay. They, I mean, they're wonderful to work with. Neat. How does a horse get in the Hall of Fame? What are the qualifications? Well, there's two basic qualifications. Have to have won an Eclipse Award, and of course the horse had to train in Aiken. Okay. Well, you have an actual Eclipse Award on display in the museum, but still a lot of people ask, what is an Eclipse mm -hmm. Award? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the equivalent to um, a football player winning a most valuable player in the Super Bowl. I mean, it's a national recognized championship. And we have had 40 horses from our little town <laughs> receive that honor. And that's, I don't think there are a lot of towns that can say that. Sure, sure, especially towns of this size. Absolutely. So that award is presented when? We usually, if we have a, a, a candidate um, that meets all the qualifications, it'll be the Sunday after the Aiken trials. Okay, and you say we have, a, have that. Who, who decides, let's say there's multiple horses that are you know, in the running. Mm -hmm. Who decides that? Well, if in terms of the um, Hall of Fame, 
you know, there really isn't any kind of decision other than those two qualifications. Okay. When it comes in terms of the Aiken Trained Horse of the Year, we developed that award, the advisory board, the Hall of Fame advisory board, developed that award to recognize an Aiken Trained Horse who may have had an outstanding year, but for whatever reason didn't win an Eclipse Award. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That particular award, you have to meet two out of three criteria. Of course, trained in Aiken, won a grade one stakes race during the year, or exceeded $1 million in career earnings. Okay. And who decides that? Be honest with you, the horse decides it. Right. You know? Sure. But what I do is I keep track of what our Aiken trained horses are doing during the year. I pick out who have met the qualifications. And if there is a tie for some reason, then we go back and look at yearly earnings. And if one horse wins more earnings than another horse in a single year, that's when it goes to that horse. And the Hall of Fame Advisory Board um, works very carefully in, in making sure we're picking the right horse, but stats don't lie. Sure, so. sure. There's more to the Hall of Fame, though, than just the pictures of the horse of the year and the, and the recognition. Sort of give us a walking tour, if you will, through okay. the Hall of Fame. What all's in there? Okay, well, when you come in the front doors, um, the first thing you're going to see is actually the Hall of Fame room, which has exhibits on each of our 40 national champion racehorses. There's also an exhibit on the Aiken Train Horse of the Year. In the next room, we have a what we call a gallery, and we have a display of racing memorabilia from the Craigwood Stables. Uh, Charles Englehart owned those stables, and okay. Mac Miller trained for them. We have about 100 trophies from just that one stable. In that room, that gallery room during the year, we also have art exhibits, we have historical exhibits, educational exhibits. And then as you go up the stairs, you'll, you'll go up on the Mac Miller staircase. Uh, Mr. Miller was a longtime trainer here in Aiken, trained Sea Hero, who won the 93 Kentucky Derby. Okay. So we have the, uh, a staircase you know, dedicated to him. And at the top of the staircase is what I think is a very uh, great exhibit. It's about Aiken's African-American community and their contributions to the local racing industry. Um, a lot of people don't know about that story. And it's very important that people know what that contribution is. I mean, Aiken, the horse industry in Aiken is amazing, and we would never have had it had not it been for the African-American community. They were the grooms. They were, mm -hmm. they were trainers. They were exercise riders, mm -hmm. uh, hot walkers. There's also, uh, at the end of that hallway, uh, an exhibit on equine dentistry where we have some antique uh, equine dentistry tools and some horse skulls. Kids love that room. They love to go look at the skulls. <laughs> sure. Um, also upstairs, we have uh, what we're getting ready to open this fall is a research room. Uh, Mike Freeman, who passed away a couple of years ago, he was a longtime trainer here. And his family has donated all of his blood horses, which is the trade magazine for the thoroughbred industry, from 1946 on. And that's going to be a wonderful uh, research tool for college students, high school students, mm -hmm. trainers, uh, owners who want to do a little bit of research on history of horse racing or the bloodlines of the horses. Our newest exhibit is the Dogwood Room, which opened up in October of last year. And uh, Mr. Campbell, uh, very gracious to give us a, a collection of trophies that his horses have won over the years. Um, some racing silks, a lot of uh, photographs. I think the neatest thing in the room is the uh, saddle uh, blanket that uh, Palace Malice wore okay. in the uh, Belmont. Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. see that, it's still got the dirt on it, it's great. Um, <laughs> As you go into the hayloft, the hayloft is now the Jim Maloney and Pete Bostwick exhibits. Mr. Maloney was a longtime trainer here, um, had two, trained two champion racehorses, Lamb Chop and Gamely. Um, if you live in Aiken, you know the last name Bostwick. Mm, uh, sure. a very important family here, very big in polo, but Pete was also a steeplechase jockey and was inducted into the National Hall of Fame as a steeplechase jockey. And he also was a, a trainer of steeplechase horses and flat racers. Mm -hmm. And then behind the hayloft, we renovated several of the bedrooms that are there. And one of them is just a little small library that people can go in and, 
and look. And then we have two children's rooms, which are real fun. We have stick horses that they can ride. Um, one of the rooms we had the bottom part painted with chalkboard paint so they can go in there and draw their own little race horses and color them. And we have fun photographs and books and toys and puzzles. Um, so a lot of people don't realize about the children's room. We want kids to go up there yeah. and we want them to make all the noise that they want. Sure, sure you do. What about out in the stables? You have, you used to have some exhibits out there. We still have those? Well, we're working on upgrading those. Uh, years ago, we had some racing silks that were on the stall doors, but they only represented a few of the stables that owned our champion racehorses. Over this summer, I've been updating all of that. Um, we will now, probably within the next two weeks, have all 27 silks up. Um, mm -hmm. Some of our stables owned more than one national champion, like Green Tree had five. But we'll have those up on the doors. And one thing new that we're doing is we're putting a little placard underneath each one that has the name of the stable or the owner to a little bit about the history and a little bit about the horses uh, that represented that stable. So I'm excited about that. That should be available for anybody to come look uh, in a couple of weeks. Another thing we're doing is we're taking one of the stalls and we're creating an exhibit inside about the Aiken training track and about trainer Mike Freeman. That's going to be a really neat exhibit. Um, the Aiken training track last year got a new sign. They asked if we wanted the old sign. Like, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> so one whole wall is basically nothing but this training track sign. And uh, when you have the stall door open and you walk by, you can't help but see it. Um, we have the original safe that the Post Brothers had from 1942 at the training track office. Yeah. We've got an aerial photo of the training track itself, talking a little bit about, you know, where the, the furlong markers are, mm -hmm. um, where Blue Peter's tree is, mm -hmm. uh, the clocker stand. So it's, it's going to be a really neat exhibit, and that'll be open uh, hopefully by the end of September. Okay. I know uh, probably the biggest, from a customer standpoint, is Christmas in Hopelands. Mm -hmm. Are you are you aiming to have all that open and, and done by Christmas in Hopelands? Oh yeah, yeah. Good. It'll it'll definitely be open by Christmas in Hopelands. Good, good. Part of the renovations, I guess, and I don't want to say this in a negative way, but prior to a big event that <laughs> happened in 2000, it, it was mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot that was going on. Right. over there some things were just sitting and in displays not stagnant but we weren't changing them out as much but and i, I loved it because you could tell me the exact minute when you got the phone call <laughs> so in on december the 29th at two o'clock two o'clock in the morning <laughs> afternoon. Well, the afternoon we got a phone call that the hall of fame was on fire yes and i'll never forget having to go over there we were probably most of us were probably off during the christmas break mm -hmm. and we went over there but public safety did a great job yes they did they salvaged the building yes they did but due to that fire a lot of upgrades and yes. it was it was an electrical fire it was an electrical fire that started in the hayloft mm -hmm. and public safety did do a, a great job i actually went and looked at the uh, i guess the call sheet and within three minutes of getting the alarm they were there yeah. It was, it was amazing. But uh, we did, we got, we got new carpet. We found some spots in some of the floors that need work on, new paint, had electrical upgraded, um, new alarm system put in, made sure we had a new fire suppression system in. Mm -hmm. So I always believe that out of bad things come good. <laughs> and in this case, it was, it was true. Um, the Hall of Fame was closed for about three or four months because we had to take all our photographs and take them to a room at the week center and just lay them on tables and leave them alone and I let them just that. dry out. And luckily the State Museum in uh, Columbia offered to uh, securely house all our trophies uh, until uh, we could come back and get them and reopen them, which was, uh, they reached out to us during that time and I thought that was very nice. I'd forgotten about those things laying at the week center now that you mentioned that, yes, I, I remember that. forever. Oh. <clears throat> there have been some other recent renovations, one being the restrooms. I think you're going through that maybe now or that's open. Tell us a little bit about some recent renovations. Well, um, the restrooms actually are open now. We used to have just one. We had two bathrooms in one of the stalls at the museum. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of funny. Visitors would come in and say, you know, where's the restroom? I'm just like, stalls are in the stall. <laughs> um, but we did renovate. Uh, and took another stall and made them handicap accessible. 
um, our parts division kind of um, watched over that project and did a great job with it. So now we have two handicap accessible bathrooms um, at the Hall of Fame with tables for baby changing tables and um, and I guarantee you at Christmas and Hope ones those are going to be well welcome because oh, sure. uh, there was uh, quite a line when you it's kind of hard to get you know mm -hmm. that many people into one restroom but uh, mm -hmm. they look great I mean they look great and they maintain the integrity of what the inside of the stall looked like they didn't really change the look other than pouring a concrete slab so that was really uh, a great thing that happened is they really didn't change the look of it yeah. and those are open all the time not uh, just when the hall of fame's open they are open all the time for the public yes good, good. you've also brought technology into the Hall of Fame, yes. I guess. Tell us some of the things that you're doing now that people can watch races, I think. Right, right. We have uh, five TVs and we're hooked up to live horse racing. Um, you can watch it anytime you want. You just can't bet on it, say, just in legally. case. Legally, you cannot bet <laughs> on it. We have had people come in the museum before that will watch a race and you can see them reach for their wallet and we're like, no, we, we can't do that here. But yeah, you can watch live horse racing. We also um, are working on our Facebook page. Our website is fixing to go undergo a new design. We have received uh, races from Kentucky Derby Museum and the National Racing Museum and in Keeneland of our different races for most of our champion race horses. Okay. Those are going to be made available on our Facebook page and on our website for anybody to see. Um, so we, we try to keep things interactive mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and to keep things interesting. So one day I would love to have complete touch screen technology sure. in there um, where people can do that on their own, put, pull up whatever they want to uh, inside the museum. So. We'll see what happens with that. You never know. We might develop a Hall of Fame app and there you go. And that'll be our, our mm -hmm. technology, new technology mm -hmm. project. What's the website? Give us that address. It is www.akenracinghalloffame.com. Okay. It takes money to do this. Yeah. I know you've been successful. You've gotten some grants to help you mm -hmm. out over there. But how basically how's the Hall of Fame funded? Well, the the things uh, that the building needs like water and electricity, things like that, that those are covered within the, the City of Aiken budget. A few of our programs are also covered in the budget, uh, Breakfast at the Gallops, the kids programs that we try to do, um, but still we get sponsorships, mostly our projects and our exhibits of trying to keep our exhibits up and new and, and fresh and any repairs that might need to be made. I have to go out and raise donations and sponsorships for that and we've been very successful with it. Um, had a lot of, of uh, great people here in Aiken, stables and organizations, individuals give us money to help uh, keep things fresh over there. They support the Hall of Fame and know how important it is. You've had some very interesting art shows yes. over there and I can't remember the little guy's name. It's a one word name. Peb. Peb, thank you. I couldn't remember that. Peb. How do you reach out to those people and, and why are they willing to send their stuff to Aiken to display it in our museum? Well, Miss Tower left amazing records of every artist that had ever been over there while she was uh, the director of the museum. So I was able to go back through that and get some, some artists from that. And they had already been here. They know what the Hall of Fame was like. They loved Aiken so they were willing to come. But also I have people on my advisory board who know artists, have a personal relationship with them or know somebody who knows somebody and we're able to, to use them to get artists in. Uh, Peb was a, a coup to have him <laughs> in here. Uh, he is, his name is uh, Pierre Balloch but he goes by Peb. Mm -hmm. But he used to uh, do the daily race form, all the, the caricatures for the daily race form. He did that for like 40, 45 years. Oh, wow. And so I'm friends with someone who is friends with the person who does his website. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> work your contacts. And, and we also have people who call us and say, hey, I came to this show or I saw something on your website. I'm an artist. I would like to display, have them send me a packet of information. Mm -hmm. We look it over with the advisory board and 
they help make that determination of whether yes or no we're going to have a particular artist come in. Okay. How often do you change those out during the year? Does it vary, I'm sure? We have about three shows a year. Okay. Um, and when we do have a show, we like to have it up for three to four weeks if possible. And then we rotate those out, maybe put a historical exhibit in, take that out, put an art exhibit in, take that out, put an educational exhibit in. So every month we try to, to rotate shows out. Mm -hmm. Now I know you're not at the Hall of Fame every hour that it's open. Yeah. You'd probably like to be, but it just, <laughs> yeah. it just doesn't work out. There's some administrative stuff that you have to do too. <laughs> right. But you have a docent program that has really grown over the last few years. Tell us about your docent program and how people can get involved. I have a wonderful docent program. Mm -hmm. Our docents uh, are people who volunteer to, to open and close the museum, answer customer questions. They don't have to know anything about horses, but if they have an interest in them, we'll, we'll train them. Or a lot of times they just have an interest in history. And we're real lucky, we've got about 25 right now. And the majority of those are from the senior, City Vacant Senior Tax mm -hmm. Worker Program. Mm -hmm. And um, they receive customer service training, they receive training about the horses, the Hall of Fame, so they can answer questions for the public, um, they greet the public. And it's been a great, great program. And, and I like that I can trust someone to be there and, and open this facility because I want to make sure that they love the Hall of Fame the way that I do and they're going to take care of it. And I've been very lucky in that, uh, in that way. Um, to be a docent, we're starting to have trainings usually on the third Monday of each month. We've got one coming up in September. If someone is interested in being a docent and attending the training, they just need to give me a call at my office at Rypatch and um, my number is 643-2121. Okay. And I'll be glad to talk to them about it. And we'll also put your uh, email address up too so yeah. people will have that and they can reach you. What have we missed? I mean the Hall of Fame is one of those great things in Aiken that we have that people just, you know, if you're new to this community or if you've lived here for a long time, if you haven't seen it, you really need to go see the Hall of Fame. You do. It's, it's really, one of our board members called it, um, you know, horse racing may have its triple crown but Aiken has a gym in the <laughs> Hall of Fame. Uh, it, it's a unique museum. We try to make things self-guided. If you want a personal mm -hmm. tour, we can do that. But, you know, a lot of people walk in Hopeland Gardens, but they see that the museum and they think, oh, that's not open or that's private residence or something. No, come on in, you know, see what Aiken is and, and see how the horses have contributed to Aiken. Uh, you'll be amazed, yeah. absolutely amazed. The Hall of Fame's also on the... Uh, Saturday tours yes. that Jenny does out of the tourism division. And I, I, don't, I know you don't want to do this for everybody, but if somebody's got a group in town <laughs> and it's an off time or whatever, I know you've opened the doors before and, and taken people through and they can just contact you to do that. Absolutely. I've done private tours before. Um, again, if it's during off hours, we recently had a mother and daughter whose brother was playing in the, uh, the Dixie Boys baseball tournament. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for something to do, and they came on an off hour. They called me and said, my daughter really loves horses. So I went over there and spent about 30 minutes with them, two people. Mm -hmm. I, that's fine. I don't care if it's two people. I don't care if it's 20 people. I don't care if it's 30 people. If it's an off time and that's, you know, you can't come during regular business hours, call me. I'll set up a day and time to go over there because yeah. I love sharing the story. It's been good. I know working with you, like we said, for 30-something years, your passion for this the Hall of Fame, and not just the Hall of Fame, I think that's your primary passion, but for Hopelands itself and Rye Patch and everything that goes on, it's been nice to have someone on staff who really is passionate about what they're doing over there. Oh yeah, this is a, man, if you can't be happy working at Hopelands and Rye Patch, you can't be happy. <laughs> it's a fun ride, it's a, it's pardon a, the pun, that's It is, it's a fun ride. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. For being on here today. Let me just mention in the next couple of weeks, we've got Stuart Biedenboe, the assistant city manager coming on, Alicia Davis, our human resources director. And we're very excited uh, to have the mayor who's going to join us in a few weeks. Mayor Kavanaugh will be joining us. So thanks for watching and have a great week.